Thank you, Michelle. Thank you very much. Just another word about this wonderful book, Mind, Carriage, and Personality, Volume 2. We'll be studying all 49 chapters in our prayer meeting. And even if you can't make prayer meetings, I encourage you to get the book. Uh, the principles in here are absolutely uh, amazing. We look forward to starting our trek through the book beginning in February. This Wednesday, I'll do my last session on the book of Acts, studying chapter 28. For those who attend first service next week, you'll get a chance to hear the new youth pastor for the first time, Pastor James Monroe the Fourth, James Monroe Reed the Fourth, and uh, then he'll speak for the second service in February. Matthew two and verse three. It's the first time I've been with you since the first Sabbath of the year. We were in the Bahamas the next Sabbath for their annual winter convention. Outstanding experience there, though the weather was not much warmer than it was here. <laughs> I was glad I was not there for a vacation. It would have been a great ripoff. <laughs> I say to my Bahamian friends that uh, <laughs> we enjoyed ourselves very much. Our services are very popular there. I think one day we did have sunshine. It got up to about 65, and it wasn't too, uh, wasn't too bad. Last Sabbath, I did my farewell sermon for the Lanham Bowie congregation, wishing them well as they go forward in what they are doing, and doing very, very well. Matthew 2 and verse 3. When Herod the king had heard these things, he was what, church? He was troubled, and all Jerusalem with him. And then... Our scripture reader, and you'll note now that every Sabbath when we read scripture, we will stand. Scripture is a word from the Lord, and there'll be no more sitting when we read God's word in the service. We're just tweaking things a bit as we move forward. God's spirit, preached upon last year, has moved upon all of us to be more reverent and devoted to him. What do you say? Genesis 3 and the famous verse 10. And he said, I heard thy voice in the garden, and I was, what's the next word? Afraid. I was afraid because I was naked, and I hid myself. My subject today, the fungus of fear, part one. Couldn't do it in one sermon. Next week, we'll focus on the fungus of fear again, but we'll look at the backside of fear, which is anger. You should have missed this week and be here. Well, all right. The fungus of fear. Well, we should look to the Lord. Father, teach us now in Christ's name. Amen. Let, let me begin by reminding you, thanks so much, Michelle, beautiful, uh, reminding you of the preaching goals for this year. We've talked about it, but in these first few Sabbaths, we need to make sure that it's in our minds where we're going. First of all, it's about the personal work of the Spirit in you, hence the theme, Spirit Renovated. And then, in our preaching theme, we hope that the resultant renovation of the Spirit of God in you will produce a service-dedicated Christian. So the last part of our theme, service-dedicated. Spirit-renovated, service-dedicated. We're saying it now, spirit-renovated, service-dedicated. The end result is something we call, Julie, a disciple. And we've just caught on 
Yvonne, the Holy Spirit hit your husband on the head and he gave us a definition of disciple that the team bought into. A disciple is a person who is serving God and others no matter what the cost. So that's the goal. That's the goal. And to do this, we've been preaching out of the Gospels. All of our sermons will come out of the Gospels, Matthew, Mark, Luke, and John. We'll be studying specific areas of the life that need renovation. That's why I'm talking about fear today. And then in prayer meetings, studying mind, character, and personality, getting into the inner sanctum of the soul that we might be renovated. And so two weeks ago, Pastor Boyd preached on the the, 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 the teaching about failure, this, this Christians must get away from this defeatist mindset. Christians must live as winners. Oh, shoot, that was a pitiful response. Christians must live the triumphant life. I heard that coming out in Jacob's prayer. You prayed this morning, boy. If you, don't, if you never pray again, you did some praying today. That prayer lifted up your pastor. It was a triumphant prayer. He claimed the good things from God. What do you say? And Boyd talked about that. And then I, I began two weeks ago by, by looking at the genealogies of the, of the Bible, particularly in Matthew. We found that it's in these genealogies that, we, that we, we, we find identity and who we are. But more, we learned that from the study of our ancestry, there can be hope because as we studied that chapter, we found that out of all that DNA confusion listed in the first chapter of Matthew, uh, Cliff, out of all that DNA confusion, a Savior was born. Jesus came from, from the line that had Tamar in it and, and Bathsheba in it. Come on, somebody. And Rahab the harlot. All these and these and these shaky kings. The Lord decided to show us that, that, that in human flesh, Victory can be claimed. I don't have to be a victim of my grandmother's sins or my daddy's sins. Christ can renovate me. What do you say? The ultimate goal, therefore, of the Spirit is to remove the encumbrances in you. We all have encumbrances. So we can have the joy and freedom of real service to man through Christ. Last week, Brother Gadsden talked about how the church needs to go out, the service end, like the Israelites, uh, canvas Jericho and, and find how they're going to do God's work. And then, Pastor Boyd emphasized the challenge of worry. Worry. See, notice his connection. He went from the feelings of defeat to worry. See, worry is defeatist thinking. Are y'all listening to me? Yes. Worry is defeatist thinking. So continuing, today I want to look at the fungus of fear. Now I'll spend the first part of next week's sermon defining what a fungus is. See, I just, I just my, my, my face wrinkled up talking about it. The fungus, that's for next week, of fear. Let's go back now and look at that, that, that wording in Matthew. Let me start there, Matthew. And we'll see how Matthew ties in with Genesis. Go back to Matthew 2. And I'll be working my way through Matthew for the next several weeks. And the phrase, he was troubled. William F. Beck in his translation of the New Testament called the New Testament in the language of today, renders the passage to say, and he was alarmed. All of us know that the word alarmed could have been pre replaced by the word fear. He was fearful. Herod was afraid. The announcement of Jesus made Herod afraid. Now, I'll spend more time on King Herod next week because he's a, he's a fellow with problems. He's a man who grew up in the church 
and never found peace in the word. That's next week. Eugene Peterson translates this same phrase in his popular message paraphrase. He says, when word of their inquiry came to Herod, he was terrified, which we know is his exaggerated, that is exaggerated fear, even, even panic, even panic. In the New Testament by Woost, which is probably the closest to the original Greek of any Bible that I have, he, he translates, uh, he was stirred up or irritated. And of course, uh, the stirring and irritation is a manifestation of this word fear. We'll see that when we study the English word. The Greek word is etarprethe, out of parousio, which means his mind was filled with fear and terror. Have you ever been afraid? I'm going to lead you now into a moment of honesty. But to make sure that we that we that we that we that we really we really share. You're looking now toward the person next to you, near you, in front of you. And you're going to take, I'll give you two minutes to talk about what scares you to death. Go on right now, smack dab, do it. <laughs> don't sit there like you don't have any fears, you know you do. What scares you to death? <laughs> and you who are watching, you're doing that right now at home, wherever you are, you're discussing what scares you. I see folks looking at me. You can't discuss it looking at me. Find somebody. Tell them what makes you afraid. <laughs> I hear one of our little children talking about her fears. I'm picking her up, Larry. Now, when you're finished, look forward. We don't need the whole story of your life. You just got two minutes. What scares you? Psychologists, Phil, have, have said that most people are not honest about their fears. It's, a, it's an unnerving thing. to say that you're afraid. And real fears, we've discovered, are deep in us. Deep in us. Herod was afraid. The English define the word in this way. A feeling of anxiety and agitation caused by the presence of danger or evil or pain. But it has a positive end. Fear is also defined as respectful dread or awe. Remember the text? The fear of the Lord is the beginning of wisdom. It's defined, uh, Paul Buckmeyer, as a feeling of uneasiness, apprehension. These are the English definitions of fear. All of these definitions, watch the pastor now, watch me now. All of these definitions take form, take on meat. Take on character when you go to Genesis 3. Genesis 3, verses 9 and 10. Genesis 3, verses 9 and 10. Let's read together. Verse 9. And the Lord, everybody, and the Lord God called unto Adam and said unto him, where art thou? Now, now get the setting. Get the setting. This is the Lord calling. See, this, this, this thing about fear is going to get deep before we're done. This is the Lord calling. Where are you? Then the words that tear the heart in verse 10. You're reading? And he said, I heard thy voice. Whose voice? Whose voice? 
And what was his response? God causes fear. Now, Sister Kobe, before we're done today, you're going to understand that fear is relational. Fear finds birth in the midst of poor relations. In this case, you see, I love, whenever I preach a subject, I always go back to see where that subject appears in Genesis. Remember, Genesis covers the first 3,000 years of the 6,000 years of Earth's history. So everything in the Bible finds roots in Genesis. And so now, we're finding the first nucleus, CJ. Here it is. Here it is. Here it is. When man separated from God, fear became possible. The presence of fear, Lisa, has something to do with our God relationship. See, Adam and Eve already before sin had experienced the fear that is awe and respect. We call that positive fear, reverence. The great God who created was their regular evening visitor. They enjoyed face-to-face -face communion with the Lord of humanity, Jesus, who according to the apostle John had made all things. But now having sinned, having done what? Sin. Having done what? For the first time, humans experience the other side of fear, the fungus of fear, parasitical fear, fear that eats and paralyzes, that produces dry mouth and sweating hands, fear that increases heart rate and produces nervous stomach, fear that eats at one's self-confidence and, 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 and can reduce a person to instant Poor decision making. I have proof. I have proof. For as soon as fear gripped his heart, his next response was, the woman whom thou gavest to be with me, she gave me the fruit and I did eat. He caught fear, turned a full-grown, perfect man into a lying wimp. All of a sudden, Daria, the man who had the best brain ever put in a human body, untainted by sin, now suddenly becomes an instant poor decision maker because he's afraid. Fear is more, Michelle Baker, than an emotion. Fear is a fungus. It drains. It eats. It reduces, it demeans, it paralyzes, it blinds fear. Put my lessons on the screen. The Genesis record and what happens there teaches us some lessons about fear. I guess they didn't hear me. Wrong list. The first list on page three, negative fear does not appear. The first list. There we go. All right. All right. Let's read these lessons found in Genesis 3, 9, and 10. Are you with me, church? Let's read. Come on. Negative fear does not appear until after sin. Number two, fear is relational. We are afraid of something or someone. Fear is never a dangling participle. It's attached to something. There are people who grow up afraid of men because somebody sexually abused them when they were a child. There are people who grow up angry, angry because someone took advantage of them and when, when they were powerless as a child. And you'll see in next week's sermon that anger and fear are identical twins. People use anger to hide fear. 
Show me, a, show me a person who's abusive to their family. I'll show you a person who's afraid to lose their family, but doesn't have enough Christian love to know how to translate their fear into positive emotion. So they choose anger. They intimidate. They push. They shout. The real problem is they're afraid, but they don't know how to say, I'm afraid. got to stay away from next week's sermon. Let's keep reading. Let's keep reading our lessons. We haven't finished them. Number three, read, positive fear was replaced by negative fear when man's relationship with God was damaged. That's the one you can't forget. You know, my good brother, that the Bible says perfect love does what? Cast out fear. So you, have a, you, so, you, so, so you have a husband and wife who are having a difficult relationship and, 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 and they're afraid of how things are going to come out. And rather than admitting that they're afraid and, and, and having a good positive conversation, they, they cover their fear with anger and attack. Don't sit there quiet. You better say amen. It takes courage to face fear. Cowards hide from their fear. You do well to sit quietly. Let's continue our list of lessons from just Genesis 3, 9 and 10. Four, read, negative fear leads to poor reasoning. <laughs> You know, have you ever been <laughs> caught off guard by something, you know, and you say, scared to death, you know? Uh, you, you, have you ever, you ever thought about some things you do when you really get scared, you know? You, you jump, you holler, you duck. <laughs> Come on, y'all. Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> and you ever been caught off guard, I mean, really scared, and, 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 and you say later, I don't know what I did. You really don't. You really don't know what you did. <laughs> Fear affects reasoning. Yeah. Yeah. Go back, let's finish up. Five. <laughs> Eve wanted to break his neck. She's hiding behind the bush. Come on now. <laughs> He's going out to speak for the family, deal with God, and this jumbo says, the woman. Can you imagine what went through Eve's mind at that moment? His fear separated him from his wife. Fear is divisive. Are you thinking with me? One more, one more, one more. Read, negative fear creates insecurity, and insecurity breeds more and you get into the vicious cycle, the vicious cycle, the vicious cycle. So we see a pattern in Genesis 3 and for it in Scripture. The examples of negative fear and its results are rampant in the Bible. Uh, take Noah, Genesis 9, 20 and 21. Noah got drunk, remember that? You ever ask yourself why he got drunk? Noah walked out of that ark, and the world he had seen before the flood was gone. Come on, come on. Picture Noah. Have mercy on Noah. The trees were gone. The, 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 the lakes were gone because there were no seas. The lakes were gone. The flowers were gone. The animals were gone. His friends and neighbors were gone. He could not take it, and he drowned his fear in liquor. The fear of the unknown. Genesis 12, 11 through 13. Remember Abram going down to Egypt? Says to his wife, now you know you're fine, honey. You turn heads. 
seems to me we ought to work out an arrangement. We get to Egypt, I'm your brother, you're my sister. Isn't that what he said? Oh, those are my own words. So look for those words in the Bible. That's my own words, but that's, that's what he said. The fear of people. Fear of the unknown. The fear of people often causes people to lie and pretend. So you won't, you won't, you won't tell anybody that you're a custodian. Nothing wrong with being a custodian. But you're afraid of what they will think of you, so you lie. Fear of the unknown, fear of people. Genesis 16, 1 and 2, Sarah. God said she was going to have a baby. Didn't he say it? She did not take God at his word and sets up this Hagar foolishness. Because she was afraid, listen to me, she was afraid of how she would look in her husband's eyes. The third fear. First fear, the fear of the unknown. Second, fear of other people. Third, fear of not meeting people's expectations. And so some of you have sat in CPC all these years. You haven't held one office. You've not been on one missionary band. You haven't done nothing for fear you won't meet other people's expectations. Well, pastor, I'm not, you know, because I, I, don't, I, don't, I don't talk well. Neither did Moses. You, you, you've never allowed yourself to bask in the sunshine of God's love. If you... It, it, help me, Jesus, if you exist, if you're here today, it's because God thinks you're important. That's why you're alive. He does not waste breath and lung and power. God needs you. And you're letting your fears of meeting other people's expectations cause you never to meet God's expectations. And who can forget Mrs. Lot, Genesis 19, 15, 17, 24, 26. Angel said, get on out of here. Leave the townhouse and the Jaguar in the garage. <laughs> Take the clothes on your back and the one pair of shoes that are comfortable to walk in. Yeah. Come on now. Leave them appliances in that place and head for the hills. And by the way, Mrs. Lot, do not look back. The fourth fear, fear of the loss of material comfort. And so, John and Kim, as we face these last days, Lord, help us, Pastor. As we face these times of trouble and God begins to strip us of those things we think are important, we're going to find out where our faith really is. We will not have the things at our fingertips that would, James, we've taken for granted. They will not be there. They will not be available. And will the fear of the lost loner, of, 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 of material comforts, cause us to cop out on God, the great supplier? I've been telling you all for 16 years, he said, your bread and water shall be sure. So I have said to you, keep a cup and a knife for the butter. We can work our way through Scripture, folk. Tamar, Judah's daughter-in-law, who prostituted herself, who prostituted herself and had sex with her own father-in-law for fear of being disinherited. 
Can we forget Moses, who tried to hide a dead man's body to keep from losing his princely status? The things that people do for fear of losing status. Are you listening to your pastor today? Or the, the children of Israel, who turned a 40-day trip into a 40-year trip because their fear of God's intentions toward them. Remember, they got to the Jordan River in about 40 days. Remember that? And then they sent the spies, Gaston preached about it. You remember that? And the spies came back and said, it's too much for us. And two said, we can do it. And they bought the fear line. See, I'm back in Genesis now. Listen to the pastor. I'm back in Genesis now. See, the, 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 the thing the devil likes to do is cause you more than anything else to fear God's intentions toward you. You've been diagnosed with cancer. The earthquake in Haiti has wiped out your family. Come on now. You didn't get the promotion. You have no money to pay your rent. And the devil says, see, God, if he can make you afraid of God, I told you, fear is relational. Separate yourself from your connection of faith with God, and fear becomes a fungi that eats you up down inside. David. David, for fear of being exposed, lied and committed murder. Let me tell you something the devil likes to do to you. You get involved in mess like David, and stuff starts getting out. You figure you can lie your way through it. And don't even pause to realize that when you lie your way through it, now the devil's really got you. Because God can't save a liar. And now he's got you in two sins. The one you, the one you did that got out, and now the second one trying to keep it from getting out. Ask David. I'll say one thing for him, though. When old Nathan the prophet came to his house and pointed his bony finger in David's face, and told him the story about the lamb. David said, that's enough. I am the man. Let's give David a hand. Because that response is going to save somebody's soul in this room. And can the ears of your imagination hear the loud convulsive sobs of a man in a garden because he was afraid to stand for what he believed and the person in cause he believed asked Peter what raw fear can do to a man. He cursed his own Savior's name for fear. Don't talk about him. Don't talk about him. Don't look down on him. His problem simply was he was afraid to stand for what he believed. So don't you talk about Peter. Don't you dare raise your righteous nose at Peter. He simply was afraid to say, here I stand. I can do no other. So at the party, at the office, he did not. At the Adventist party on Saturday night, he did not. And then there's that pitiful picture, Greta Brown, that pitiful, uh, I hate even reading uh, John 20, verse 19. It, 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 it turns my stomach, 11 grown men hiding in a room for fear. These are the leaders of the church for fear. These are the ones who should have been standing at the tomb of Jesus Christ to applaud him when he came out of the tomb. Hiding for fear. Denimar and Dure will be because of fear that some Seventh-day Adventists will not be standing there saying, lo, this is our God. We have waited for him, and he will save us for fear. Fear, therefore, is one of Satan's best weapons. 
I mean, the word in all of its forms, fear, feared, fearest, feareth, fearful, fearfully, fearfulness, fearing, fears, <laughs> appears in the Bible over a thousand times. Fear is in the genes of mankind. It's, 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 it's so, so Satan uses it. And, and then fear, watch me, listen, you're listening now, you're listening, fear has cousins. <laughs> Anxiety, come on, agitation, insecurity, are you with me? And then fear has children. Worry, tension, uh, can I get a witness? Stress, doubt, and its biggest baby, anger. So through fear, Satan can block one's vision, curtail joy, and reduce even a person's physical functions. My first statement on the screen, that which brings sickness of body. Read, that which brings sickness of body and mind to nearly all is dissatisfied feelings and discontented repinings. It brings what? Sickness. Where? And the? See, I, 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 I know something about paralyzing fear. The first time they told me I had to preach at Oakwood College, I was a freshman, Kenny, and I joined this group called the Evangelers. <laughs> Wanted to be accepted by my fellow, you know, Evangelers. And they said, next Friday, you will preach. Have you ever been so scared you can't see? <laughs> I, I couldn't see. I mean, you know, you know I'm serious, folks. My, 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 my eyes, Michelle, they glassed over. I could not see. I, I, I remember I stumbled going up the steps of the pulpit, fell flat. Students are laughing now. <laughs> see, when I read this statement, this is real to me. Fear can do a job on you physically. You see, we'll get up there. That's fear. Come on now. That's why when some of us get afraid, we scream. <laughs> and that's why men, ladies outlive us. They scream. <laughs> Women will let, they, they scream. We trying to mm, be a man. <laughs> Have five strokes trying to be a man. <laughs> At wise woman, she screams her head off and she lives to see another day. <laughs> well, I got to make you smile. I'm talking about fear, you know. Let's finish reading the statement. Come on, that which no, no, no. they have not. Come on, they have not God. I told you fear was relational. Read on. They have no hope, which reaches to that within the veil. Told my Jesus, the intercessor, which is an anchor to the soul, both sure and fast. Go on, go on. There's more to the statement, I believe. Yeah, come on. All who possess this hope will purify themselves, even as He is pure. You're reading on. Such are free from restless longings, repinings, and discontent. By the way, repinings is one of her words for fear. Go on. They are not continually looking for evil and brooding over borrowed trouble. That's why the Bible says sufficient for today is the strength thereof. And there are people, and listen, I don't want to talk about you because I love you so much, but there are people whose lives are crippled because, be, see, Mark, they've been through rough stuff in their life, and they've never gotten many breaks. And so they expect the worst. Do you have friends like that? Are you like that? You just don't expect, you, you pray the prayers, but you don't expect to break. The devil has psyched you into believing that you can't have a blessing. And so you're afraid to pray bold prayers. Knocking on the door of heaven. Holding God. We'll talk about that next week. Holding God to his promises. I don't mind in the prayer saying to the Lord, you said. You said. 
And then I refer my maker to the text that he had the Holy Spirit write. You said, Lord, now I claim your promise. Ellen White says, prayers like that stir heaven. God says, all right, now I've got to get on up off this thing. Now he's holding me to my word. I'm the God who cannot lie. And so sin brought our foreparents to a lack of assurances. The garden surrounded them with safety and reliability from the, from the weather to the quality of food they picked from the tree. Their bodies knew no malfunctions. There was no debt or anger. But in one sweep, go back to Genesis 3, they went from paradise, look at this, look at Genesis 3, verse 16. This is, this, this stuff, this stuff wears me out, just wears me out, Rose. To, to read these verses just does something to me. Unto the man, unto the woman, he said, I will greatly multiply thy sorrow and thy conception, and sorrow thou shalt bring forth children, and and thy desire shall be to thy husband, and he shall rule over thee. And unto Adam he said, Because thou hast hearkened to the voice of thy wife, and hast eaten of the tree of which I commanded thee, saying, Thou shalt not eat of it. You see, we read verse 17 wrong. Men read that text and say, See, you should never listen to a woman. No, that wasn't the issue. The issue was she listened, he listened to her instead of God. Any man with any sense would listen to his wife. I'll say amen. Amen. They know you better than anybody. But check in with God first, brother. <laughs> Sometimes the lady's having a bad day. <laughs> now that's free. That's not in the notes. That's free. Free. Let's read verse 18, come on, thorns, everybody, thorns, verse 18, Genesis 3, come on, thorns also and thistles shall it bring forth to thee, and thou shalt eat the herb of the field. Now, now, look at verses 23, well, verse 19, in the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread, till thou return unto the ground, for out of it wast thou taken, for dust thou art, to dust thou shalt return. I mean, this is, this is, this is rough, this is rough, Mother Lee, this is rough, this is rough. And the residue of this has seeped down into our lives. Insecurity. You see, who knows what will happen tomorrow? And all of a sudden, Adam and Eve, whose life had been one panacea, one panacea, Elder Bramble, of just one good day after another, now all of a sudden, they don't know what the next day will bring. And the greatest joy that a woman should have in life, now Eve, carrying uh, the first child, Cain, spends the whole time in fear because he's told her it's going to hurt. So every, every human experience now is poisoned by the fungus. Verses 23 and 24, therefore the Lord God sent him forth from the Garden of Eden, a loss now of home to till the ground from whence he was taken, a loss now of even security for food. Will the ground bring forth food? So he drove out the man. Now he is, he is, he is, he is a refugee. The first two human beings on the planet are now refugees. They left the garden driven by fear, fear of being safe again, fear of each other. But more importantly than anything else, Steve, Fear of what God will do. See, I'm going to keep coming back to that, Larry, because I think that that is a thing that is stumping a lot of our relationship with God. Let's just say it in a simple sentence. Many Christians do not trust God. And let's be honest, and I say to those who are watching me right now, the thing in Haiti has troubled a lot of people. Where is the God that can allow this to happen? And Satan gets a lot of glory even out of some of our mouths. We have forgotten that God does not think temporally. He thinks eternally. Many of those unknown people whose bodies have been pushed into a big mass grave will come up in the resurrection. 
we have to focus on the good news. But because our own lives have been kicked and beaten, pushed around, we tend to fall into the pit of negativity with everybody else. Fear of God, fear of God's intentions. My fear is of preaching before an audience were paralyzing to me. And I had to face something. See, I, I smile when people now, you know, say, oh, Pastor Ride, you're so and so and so and so. I just chuckle inside. I think, well, you don't know even the half of it. <laughs> and I had to face something, Frank. Fear about preaching, listen to me, was actually a manifestation of self centeredness. You can't stand up and preach with power <laughs> God's Word if you're worried about how you're going to look, how you're going to sound, what they're going to think. You've got to get lost in the Word and let it pour through your being. And you don't care because you know it's not you, it's God. I had to come to face the fact that as long as I was afraid to preach, it was because my mind was on Henry Wright. Once your mind gets on God, preach. Now I tell you that to teach you something about yourself. Fear is a form of self-centeredness. If the person, Michelle Buckmeyer, in the crisis puts their mind on God, then you know good things can happen. But if your mind is on you, sure, you ought to be afraid. We like to think of fear, Herb, as a form of, as a manifestation of my desire to preserve myself. But fear is a form of selfishness. Another statement. I'm almost done. Just relax. Another statement. Read. The Lord frequently. Uh-uh. 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 Oh, that's the wrong one. Is it? That's the wrong one. If we take counsel with our doubts. You got the last one up there. I want the next one. If we take counsel. If we take counsel. If we take counsel. <laughs> page 475. It's on the fifth page of the sermon notes. All right, let me read it. If we take counsel with our doubts. Now listen to this. See, she's talking about spending too much time having a conversation with your fears. Wow. If we take counsel with our doubts and fears or try to solve everything that we cannot see clearly before we have faith, perplexities will only increase and deepen. But if we come to God feeling helpless and dependent, that's why I told you that fear is a form of self-centeredness. You, 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 got to, you, you know, in other words, even, even today, after all these years, I mean, I still get afraid before I preach. But now, I just say, Lord, take it. He takes the fear. You know, people say, Pastor, I, why do you preach with so much energy? Because I'm scared to death. <laughs> he takes the fear and turns it into energy. Oh, shoot. Hallelujah. If you give it to him, he'll turn it into something good. But you hold it and caress it and discuss it and embolden it. Massage it, your fears. But if we come to God feeling helpless and dependent as we really are, and in humble, and in humble, trusting faith, make known our wants to him whose knowledge is infinite, who sees everything in creation, and who governs everything by his will and word, he can and will attend to our cry and will let shine, light shine into our hearts. I'm coming home now. See, fear of not having anyone in your life can cause a person to make a bad marriage decision. Fear of not making the rent or mortgage payment can reduce you to robbing God of tithe. Fear 
of how he or she may look can tempt a pastor not to make an appeal at the end of the sermon for fear no one will come down. In other words, fear can cause you to do bad things and prevent you from doing good things. So the backside of those manifested fears is really a lack of trust in God. And so next week we'll talk more about living his promises. Now that last statement you put up there, I'm ready for The Lord frequently places us. Can we get that one back up there? Let's read. The Lord, come on everybody, come on, come on. The Lord frequently places us in difficult positions. Ah, nah, 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 nah. You, you, can't, you, can't, you, 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 you can't rush by that. Who places you there? Lord. Let's go back and do it again. The Lord, how often? Frequently. 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 Let's read it again now. The Lord frequently places us in difficult positions to stimulate us to greater exertion. He's building your faith muscles, your trust muscles. He's saying the worse it is, dig in. Do not forget Jacob, scared to death of his brother, scared to death that he was facing his last day. And he said, Lord, I ain't got enough strength to pray, so I got the hem of your garment. I will not let you go till I get my blessing. The kind of prayer where you stop using words, you're just moaning and groaning. But I read a text that says he can take your moans and groans and make them known to God. I read it. I read it. It's in the book. No more pretty prayers. No more, no more worrying about language. You just hang on to God until you feel that presence, that power that says I'm going through. Let's finish the statement. I got carried away. Finish the statement. In his, come on, in his, pro, that means, that means, that means his, his intended thinking. He's intentional. Read again. In his providence, special annoyances. Now, Paul, you, can, you can't go by that. You know that life is full of annoyances. Y'all hear me talk about the traffic in this city all the time. This morning, I was afraid I was going to be late. That's when everybody. I know exactly. You know, and you get by people, brand new car, four exhausts in the back. Surely you can do more than 35. I got an old car with just two exhausts in the back. It will do more than 35. And you're going to do it in the outside lane. <laughs> Annoyances, testing our fears. Are you with me? Yes. See, I want you to remember this as you go through this week. Let's finish the sentence. Let's finish the sentence. Come on, come on, come on. Go back. His providence special what? Sometimes occur. Read on. To test. I can testify this morning. I called Ganson. I said, I'm running late. And I knew it. I knew it. I said, every slow person on the road. <laughs> Can you imagine that somebody is pulling a trailer? They're pulling a trailer behind their car. Why are you out here in this lane? <laughs> See, folks, I don't preach stuff to you. I preach stuff to me. And then you listen and get something out of it. <laughs> Let's finish this sentence. Come on, come on, come on, come on, come on. Put it back up there, put it back up there, put it back up there. Uh, to test our patience and faith, finish it. God. The lesson comes from God. Your heads are bowed. Your eyes are closed. Focus right now. Where's my lady? Focus right now. Focus. Now, what I'm about to do may not be pleasant. Remember, we've already taught all fear is not negative. 
The fear of the Lord is positive. But when fear becomes a courage-sapping, faith-sapping fungus and depleting, it's a sign that you may have a relational issue with God. See, I, I want to close on that. See, Frank, I got to bring him back to that. The fear problem is a spiritual problem because it's connected to my connection with God. Perfect love does what, church? Cast out fear. And I don't want you to feel bad. I'm not trying to make anybody feel bad. I'm challenging you to move to another level of Christian experience. It'll become even more clear after next week's sermon. We talk about this anger side of fear. So focus for a moment. Look at yourself real good. At the beginning of the service, I had you share with somebody your fears. Well, perhaps now it takes on a bit more meaning. I'm talking about more of just fear of heights or fear of being on a roller coaster. I'm talking about the fears of life. The fears of life. You must cast that fear toward God. See, Jacob rose up. I will rise. I will rise from my fears. Jacob rose up. He rose up and faced his brother the next morning. Jesus, afraid at the cross, cried, My God, my God, why hast thou forsaken me? And then he gave it to God. Nevertheless, not my will but thine be done. And he walked to the cross with his head up. Come on, Colleen, sing that song for me. Yes, Lord. Yes, Jesus. Yes, sir. Never to give in against all odds, yet still I rise high above the clouds. At times I feel alone, yet still I. Still I 
very softly, instrumentalists. Maybe you have a, a Noah fear. You're afraid of the unknown. Maybe you've got an Abraham fear. You're afraid of other people. A Sarah fear. Afraid of not meeting the expectations of others. Or a Mrs. Lot fear. You're just afraid you can't pay the bills this month. You fear the loss of material comfort. A David fear, afraid of being exposed. Oh, we could go on and on. I'd like to give you a chance to present your fears to the Lord. Nobody need know why you're standing. But if you've taken time to focus on a fear that maybe has a fear to witness, a fear to tell the story. Yeah, folks are standing up without me asking. Go ahead and stand. You're giving a fear to the Lord. If you really listen, this is a very invasive sermon. This is a very invasive sermon. Now my next appeal, and then I want you to sing the next verse, Colleen. Maybe you've been afraid to walk down the aisle and say yes to Jesus, to come and take Bible studies, to come and prepare for baptism, to come and join CPC, to come and become a Seventh-day Adventist Christian. And maybe you have that same fear where you're watching me somewhere. But if you'd like to take your stand for Christ today, his word, his church, his way of life. I'd like for you to move out from where you're standing, come from downstairs, come from the balcony, and come down to me right now. Is there one who'll do that? Now you're praying, folk. You know what your role is. When I make the appeal, you pray. But if somebody beside you starts moving, let them out. Is there someone who will come today? Let the devil tell you what you cannot do. Maybe you'll have to face some folk back home, but go home with Jesus and tell them today. Somebody else will come. Somebody else will come. You're praying, church. You're clinging to the Holy Spirit like Jacob did. You're saying to the Lord, bring somebody. Bring somebody. If you're downstairs, you can come. One of the other overflow rooms, you can come. step today before I close this appeal You're gonna move out and walk down I gotta be sure that you don't let the opportunity go by you're praying church you're seeking God's spirit will you come God knows he wants you to come
Okay, softly, Mark, and I'm going to pray my closing prayer. You can still come down. Father, we are surrounded in this world by things to be afraid of. There's not a person in this room, pastor or member, who has not failed you in this arena of trust. We have been abused. We have been misused. We have been disappointed. And so we are afraid, Lord. We, we, we confess it. We, we, we are afraid. Uh, there are folk who are afraid to, 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 to try a health plan, to, to, to change their lifestyle, afraid they won't keep it up. And so they, ne they never try. And they continue in the same bad health rut. Lord, have mercy upon us. We're intimidated by that fungus. Today, we have stood with courage. I've stood with them. Lord, you've done marvelous things through me in the years to overcome fears. I, I praise you. I know what it is to be afraid. I really do. I thank you for your grace and your mercy. We praise your name. We praise your name. Somebody praise his name. We praise your name for tolerating us, for sending those annoyances, for sending those tests to cause us to exert. Hold us now till we return either Wednesday night or next week to continue our study of this subject, to take a hard look at Herod the Great, a man who was consumed with destructive fear drove him to kill innocent babies. Have mercy, Lord. But thank you for a strong word today and for these precious souls who have come. And the people said, you may be seated. You may be seated. Are you glad you were in the house of the Lord today? The elder will come now and call for the tithes and the offering. Remember, our worship is not yet over. We're still worshiping. We're still worshiping the tithes and the offering. Amen. Amen.